Public safety, and again we will start with topical questions. Mr. Fran McCann was listed first, but uh, he contacted the business office within the appropriate time and withdrew his name. So I call Mr. Sean Lynch. I'll get the last can call you. Would the minister agree with me that his department has failed children in care, and does he intend to hold an inquiry into care of children here? Well, in terms of the circumstances that we find ourselves in. Uh, I think that the blame lies first and foremost with the perpetrators, not the department. And the blame should always lie first and foremost with perpetrators of violence, or sexual violence, or any other kind of violence. And what the department has done um, over the course of the last number of years was, first of all, uh, we asked and, uh, Bernardo's uh, to produce a report and paid for that report to be produced in 2009 because we recognised that there was a risk there. And subsequent to the production of that report, we have taken a series of actions, including the establishment of a safeguarding board in Northern Ireland. Not all of the responsibility lies with the Department. Uh, the police have a role and the Department of Justice have a role. And whenever young people themselves don't believe that they are the victims of violence or sexual violence, you have a great difficulty. Because many of these young people um, wrongly uh, perceive uh, that they are being appreciated and shown some kind of care and attention whenever what is really happening is that it is malign attention that they are receiving uh, for people who have uh, evil purposes. So let us be very clear about where the blame lies. The blame lies with people who go after young, vulnerable people, and it is not just children in care, because 80 per cent of the children who are targeted by child so se sexual exploiters um, are not children who are in care, and we need to get the appropriate messages out here. Oh, Mr. Sean Lynch, for a second. Good morning. Good morning. So, can I ask the minister? Can he assure the public that children in care today are safe? Well, I think first of all, it's very important to indicate that children in residential care homes are in homes, and that's why they're not locked up because it is to be a home, it is not a prison. And therefore, young people have the ability to exercise some discretion and free will. And we have identified that actually those young people who are most vulnerable, and, and we have for a ver variety of reasons, um, took them to secure accommodation, very quickly reverted back to, to how they were behaving uh, previously. Uh, and that clearly locking young people up doesn't work. So it is a very difficult circumstance. Um, we will highlight to young people over and over again repeat, repeatedly of the issues and problems um, that, that can come to them um, as a result of engaging with the wrong types of people, how to avoid it, what to watch out for, um, to, when to seek support, and all of that. And we will continue to work with the police. And I think it is very important that we do recognise, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, that in all of this, I'm sure that we can um, move things forward and that we can improve things, because care of young people has improved um, over the past 10 years, improved over the previous 10 years, and I have no doubt that there are things we'll be doing in future years which are better than today. And we need to ensure that uh, we pay heed to everything that comes to our attention and we act upon it, and that is what we are seeking to do on a daily basis. I call Mr Jim Allister. Will the Minister give residential, statutory residential care homes for the elderly a chance, an opportunity to prove their viability by doing a U-turn on this policy of restricting new admissions? Well, the, the policy of restricted admissions is obviously something that a, a number of trusts have applied, not all of the trusts, I should say. Um, last year, for example, the Western Trust had an open admission policy. 80% uh, of the people in the Western Trust chose not to actually use the statutory residential homes. They opted for private residential homes. So uh, Mr Allister's point is not a, a, a um, resolve the thing in and of itself, uh, the issue. So I would suggest that <coughs> in terms of uh, residential care homes for, for the elderly, we need to look at the widest range of options for our elderly population and seek to meet their needs. But what should be front and centre of all of these things is the person 
not the facility, and the needs of that person, and where best those needs are met. And if those needs are best met in a statutory residential care home, that's not something um, that I'm opposed to. Uh, the Minister likes on this issue to hide behind the trusts, but it is his policy to restrict admissions. He told this House on the 9th of October last year, uh, when he introduced Transforming Your Care, that therefore there would be a restriction on new admissions to statutory care homes. It is that which is starving the homes of the oxygen of occupants, which makes them capable of working. Take Pinewood in my constituency. 36 bed unit starved of admissions to the point where it now has nine residents. Isn't the minister quite clearly clinging to a policy designed to close those homes? Why does he fear lifting that ban to let those homes prove themselves? Just in case uh, Mr Alistair would uh, take the Assembly down the, the wrong line on this issue, um, I think you'll find that there's more than nine residents in, in Pinewood, um, albeit nine permanent residents, um, but there's many people who use that facility for respite care as well. Um, so just to clarify that matter. And the truth is that had Mr Alistair had his way and the Trust had made their recommendations, does he honestly think that a direct rule minister would have stepped in as I stepped in, Mr Alistair's policy would have ensured the closure of Pinewood Residential Care Home. And Mr Alistair doesn't like the truth and he doesn't like the facts, and that's why, why, why he's Order. behaving as he is. I, I, would, I would wish that Mr Alistair, and indeed anybody else in the Assembly on this issue, would actually go and visit some of the new facilities that we have developed. I recently opened one in Downpatrick. It was down in Carrick Fergus, one that's not very far from Mr. Alistair's constituency. And I would urge people to actually gain a little knowledge in this subject about the standards of care that we might be able to offer our elderly population, a higher standard of care than is currently in place, and talk to the residents who will say, this is much better, talk to the staff who will say, this is much better, and talk to the families who will say this is much better, rather than hyping up and scurring elderly people who are currently in residential care homes unnecessarily. Okay, listen, if you ask a question, the Minister, you should have managed to listen to the answer. Could I call Mr Alistair Ross? Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Minister will be aware of uh, continued coverage about the issue of organ donation in recent days. Can the Minister provide an update on the survey work that his department was carrying out about public attitudes towards organ donation in Northern Ireland? Well, the Public Health Agency team conducted a face-to-face -face survey of the general public over the early summer with a representative sample of 1,012 individuals, which is a fairly uh, large number. And that was done on the basis of age, gender, social class and local government districts, so it was widespread. Um, the focus groups and stakeholder engagement also took place with health service staff, the BMA uh, charities, recipients those on the waiting list and donor families. And that work has now been concluded. And uh, I understand they uh, uh, finalised a report on their findings. So in all of this, I, I think that there is some very interesting uh, views coming out um, on organ donation. And I think that there's a lot of work to be done um, with the general public on this issue uh, to ensure that we can move and advance forward and ensure that there is more organ donation takes place in Northern Ireland with the support of the public. Supplementary from Mr Ross. Thank you. Can the Minister confirm that that uh, report will be published? Um, can he indicate to the House when he would anticipate that that will be done? And are there any early findings um, from the work that's been carried out that would be of particular interest to the Assembly? I understand that the all-party group on organ donation actually meets next week. Um, we would be very happy to make that report available to that group. I think that, that would be an appropriate um, opportunity to do it. Um, the PHA team, um, I have no doubt, will make themselves available to, to, to make a presentation uh, if they are requested. And I do appreciate the, the public and political interest um, on this issue. And if it is not possible to, for the all-party group to actually receive such a report, I will endeavour to have the report published um, in, the, in the very near future. Uh, so I think that the public need to know uh, what the responses are 
and we need to give attention to what the public say on these issues um, because I do think that it is a representative sample and will indicate very clearly uh, where the Northern Ireland public stand on this issue. And I call Mr Chris Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. This is my uh, first topical question. Can I extend my thanks to the staff of the Procedures Committee who undertook to develop my proposal to introduce topical questions and indeed extend my gratitude to my own Assembly researcher, Gareth Scott, whose idea it was to uh, proceed down this route? Can I ask, therefore, I think it's worth putting that on record. Can I ask the Minister, therefore, uh, why he is currently using scarce uh, public funds for legal cases against blood donation and adoption when his responsibility is to deliver a system that assesses uh, the health and safety of blood and indeed whether parental placements are in the best interests of the child. Well, uh, I thank the member for his modesty in the first instance. <laughs> There's uh, an old saying, self-praise is no recommendation. Uh, in terms of, of, of the issues that the members raised, I, I wasn't aware that I'd went to court with anybody. However, if someone takes you to court, you do have to respond. It would be quite foolish not to respond. And it's very interesting that uh, we have uh, public money being used in terms of um, the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission, which is a publicly funded body, taking uh, government to court. And we also have legal aid being used. And uh, we await the outcome um, in the not too distant future of one of those cases. So let, let's just see what, what, what happens as a result of that. In terms of the gay adoption, let's be absolutely unequivocal. Um, I'm just after saying that we need to pay attention to the public whenever they speak. And whenever uh, the direct rule minister, whenever, whenever the direct rule minister actually went for a consultation, that consultation revealed that over 95% of the community were opposed to gay adoption. Now, there's assembly members here, and it strikes me that they would prefer that the courts make the decisions as opposed to this House making the decisions. And with respect to the courts, this assembly is elected to represent the people of Northern Ireland. It is a crucial part of the democratic process. And we would do well to pay attention to the democratic will. And that is exactly what I am doing, Mr. Uh, De Principal Deputy Speaker, in reflecting this. I have to say that my stance was further strengthened last week when a piece of research by Queen's University Belfast and the British Association uh, for Adoption and Fostering carried out a report on looked after children. And it found that 99% of children who had been adopted had stability. This report started in 2003 as a longitudinal report and was only published last week. 99% of children in adoptive circumstances in Northern Ireland find stability. I remind the Minister that the two minute rule applies in Very the uh, Mr. Mr. Principal Deputy. Um, and that was because, and they put this, of the rigorous assessment process that takes place. So no apologies to make for not uh, repairing something which isn't broken in the first place. <laughs> Mr Little for supplementary. Well, um, thank the Minister for his response and his emphasis on the need for rigorous assessment. But how can the public be confident that he is using public funds in a responsible manner when he continues to lose legal proceedings yeah. on these issues? Yeah. Well, um, that... that that is a matter for the courts in terms of the decisions that they, that they make and the arguments that are put. But let me be absolutely clear. The courts have found, uh, European courts have found, that there is no human right to adopt. So let's just nail that at the outset. This is not about adopters. It is about the children. And we in Northern Ireland are in a different circumstance from the rest of the United Kingdom in that we have... Uh, don't have as many children on the waiting list for adoption as would be the case um, in England, Scotland and Wales. So in Northern Ireland, we have a very robust adoption system. I'm prepared to bring forward adoption legislation to this House and would have been bringing forward adoption legislation to this House that would, that would have um, upgraded it and improved it. Um, however, because others have decided to rush to court, that has been delayed. 
and I think that that is damaging to democracy. And I would have thought that Mr. Little should be a defender of democracy instead of trying to uh, do down democracy. Uh, but he may wish to do things through the courts. I would rather do things through the ballot box. Thank you. And that's the end of the period for topical questions. And we will now move on to those oral questions that have been listed for the Minister. And I call Mr.